It was really good. It was really good. There were a lot of. Uh, Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the June 2027 uh, Delaware County Council meeting. I call this meeting to order. If we could all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Charlize, would you like to kick us off? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I don't want to sit in your place. <laughs> Roll call, please. Mr. Blankin. Present. Hughes. Here. Mr. Kantz. Yes. Mr. Mogul. Here. Mr. Webb. Here. Mr. Wahed. Present. Mr. Piper. Here. Mr. Freeman. Here. All right. Just your friendly reminder that questions from the public may be directed to County Council DIST at co.delaware.in.us. Uh, again, that's County Council DIST at co.delaware.in.us. Denise, has the agenda been posted? Yeah. Great. I'll entertain an approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Dan. Second by Eugene. Roll call, please. Mr. Langan. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Kantz. Yes. Mr. Mogul. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. Mr. Piper. Yes. Moving on to the approval of the May 23rd County Council meeting. I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Motion by Dan. Second by Eugene. Any questions, comments? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mr. Langan. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Kantz. Yes. Mr. Mogul. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. Mr. Piper. Yes. All right, moving on to our transfer and appropriation agenda. Tanya, we'll start with the transfers. <clears throat> okay. Under County General, we have JL 145. We have F 119, Correctional Officer for negative 22,849.10. G 119, Correctional Officer, positive 22,849.10 for a total of zero. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ryan. Second by Dan. This is backfilling of an employee. Um, all of the backfilling of employees, actually everything in our transfer agenda had a favorable recommendation from the finance committee. So any questions, comments? Hearing none, roll call, please. Ms. Blanken. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Ms. Pants. Yes. Ms. Mogul. Yes. Ms. Webb. Yes. Ms. Whitehead. Yes. Ms. Piper. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on. Okay, next is Prosecutor 137. We have 180 Investigator negative 19 cents b115 deputy prosecutor negative 1697.81 a180 investigator positive 1698 dollars total transfer zero motion to approve second motion by ryan second by dan any questions hearing none roll call please mr flangan yes mr hughes yes mr Kantz. yes mr mogul yes mr webb yes go ahead yes mr piper yes Thank you. Okay, right. next is Public Defenders, Fund 139. We have B-155 for Public Defender, negative 27,400. C-155, Public Defender, positive 25,000. 313, Psychological Examinations, positive 2,400 for a total transfer of zero. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ryan, second by Dan. Any questions? I have a quick question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Typically on the backfill employee replacement, the, the dollar amounts are the same. Can, can somebody kind of fill me in on why this is a little different? Sure. Shelly Harvey, Public Defender's Office. We, uh, we've we had the vacancy for just a little while, and we were running um, very low on psych exam. So rather than um, have to ask for money in the psych exam line, uh, since we had a little bit of extra money in that employee line, I went ahead and, and transferred some into psych evaluations gotcha. so there's a little gap between the, the right replacements, right that money he, that would have been spent on salary right he uh, resigned as of june 1st and went to the prosecutor's office and our new person starts uh second week of july okay thank you Shelley. thank you right, any further questions hearing none roll call please mr flangan yes mr hughes yes mr Kantz. yes mr mokul yes mr webb yes mr whitehead yes mr piper yes thank you thank you Okay, next is Treasurer 127. 
We have 198 part-time, positive $3,000. 325 printing, negative 4,700. 442 computers, one thousand positive 1,700 for a total transfer of zero. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ryan, second by Dan. Any questions? I, I do have one quick question. Um, Mr. Bolt, I know you're new in the position. Um, <clears throat> when we're doing the budgets, you know, we're looking for certain stuff that we could cut or, or, or where we can move some dollars around. I'm just curious of why there's so much money available in printing to be able to take out and be transferred to somewhere else. We had um, some, we had some of the charges because we've used the company before that the, the, they weren't as much. And then the commissioners also picked up some of the tab oh, on that. Okay. So we did have some extra. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mr. Flanagan. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Pants. Yes. Mr. Mokul. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. Mr. Piper. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, moving on. Okay. Next, we're under other. First up is Family Recovery Court Grant 8192. We have A101 Program Coordinator for negative 16,557.59. B101 Program Coordinator, positive $18,702. 197 part time, <coughs> positive $780. 171 FICA, positive $224. 172 per positive $240. 176 health insurance negative $3,388.41. Total transfer is zero. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ryan. Second by Dan. Any questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mr. Flanagan. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Pants. Yes. Mr. Mogul. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. Mr. Piper. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is jail lit 1170. We have F112 correctional officer negative $19,083.04. G112 correctional officer positive $19,083.04 for a total transfer of zero. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ryan, second by Dan. Any questions? Hearing none, roll call please. Mr. Flanagan. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Pants. Yes. Mr. Mokul. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. Ms. Piper. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative Grant, 9107. 202 food items, negative 1,662.74. 335 professional services, program two, positive 2,439.52. 340 communication, transportation, travel, and training negative seven hundred and seventy six dollars and seventy eight cents for a total zero motion to approve second motion by ryan second by dan do we have any questions for emily and you did print off some information for was that for the other grant too so the frc grant uh which we just approved a minute ago we have a new employee coming in so the information i printed out for you all was to show you what we're moving around we're bringing her in part-time early because there's nobody to train her. So we got permission from the grant to do that. And the reason why we could do that is because she's not going to take, take health insurance. So that's why we took it out of health insurance. Um, so that's all for that. This one is for JDAI. And we did get permission to, to do both these grants and move money around from the grant grantor. And this is a program that they're doing. It's for summer referrals. And so they had extra money in these other accounts, and we got permission to move it all into this program <coughs> for the summer program. <clears throat> when you say she's not going to take health insurance, what what's she's the already got she health changes ins her mind? She's already got health insurance, and after after this cycle, we're not asking for health insurance because they didn't cover it all. So it's it's kind of eating into our balance, and we're not able to cover it. So this grant funded position will no longer offer health health insurance after this year because we can't cover it. So she's already covered by her husband. All right. Thank Any you. further questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Ms. Flanagan. Yes. Ms. Hughes. Yes. Ms. Pants. Yes. Ms. Mokul. Yes. Ms. Webb. Yes. Ms. Whitehead. Yes. Ms. Piper. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on. Free trial diversion, 2502, 180 investigator, negative three cents. 104 de deputy prosecutor, negative $537.97. A 180 investigator, positive $538 for a total transfer of zero. 
Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ryan. Second by Dan. Any questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Ms. Plankin. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Pants. Yes. Ms. <clears throat> Mokel. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. Mr. Piper. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Prosecutor Lit, 1170. A118 investigator, negative $18,444.17. The next line, uh, yours may read AB118. That should just be B118 investigator, positive $18,444.17. D102 deputy prosecutor, negative $44,470.69. E-102, Deputy Prosecutor, positive $44,470.69, total zero. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ryan, second by Dan. Any questions? I have a, just a quick question. Um, I see we're replacing a, a Deputy Prosecutor a couple months ago. We all voted to uh, increase salaries for the Deputy Prosecutors. Have you guys seen any positive impact from that? Is this a result of that? At Lisa Carr, Prosecutor's Office. Um, we have had a, we have replaced a deputy prosecutor, but we have had one leave since that time. When you say you've replaced a deputy prosecutor, was that deputy prosecutor here when we granted the, the salary increases and the, and the no. bonuses or no, whatever? No, we had one spot that had been empty. We've since been able to fill that spot, but we have had a prosecutor leave and go to another county. And so we are still looking for, we still have one open spot. Okay. The reason I'm asking that question is <clears throat> I remember during the details of the discussion, part of the money requested was to, to uh, allocate bonuses, retention bonuses, if you will, to some of the deputy prosecutors. Is this deputy prosecutor who left someone who received that? It, it was someone that had received a bonus as well. And she did leave and go to another county. So she received the retention bonus and then she left and went to another county. Right. She, it was prorated bonus. Yes. Okay. Thank you. She left for salary reasons. I'm not sure what reason she left. When you say prorated, you mean she received just a portion. Correct. All right. Any further questions? <clears throat> Hearing none, roll call, please. Ms. Plankin. Yes. Ms. Hughes. Yes. Ms. Kantz. Yes. Mr. Mokel. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. Mr. Piper. Yes. Public Defenders Fund 247. We have 174 life insurance, positive $75. 211 office supplies, positive $700. 184 file maintenance, negative $500. 323 travel expenses, negative $275. Total transfer is zero. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ryan. Second by Dan. Any questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Ms. Flanagan. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Hans. Yes. Ms. Mogul. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. <clears throat> Ms. Piper. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. Okay, that takes us to agenda one transfers. First under County General is Communications 124. We have B124, Communication Tech, negative 16,643.92. C124, Communication Tech, positive 16,643.92. H123, Supervisor, negative $10,000. C120, Communication Tech, negative $18,054.96. D120, Communication Tech, positive $18,054.96. 196 overtime, positive $10,000. And under supplies, we have 231 maintenance supplies, positive $1,500. 367 telephone backup, negative $1,500. Total transfer is zero. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ryan, second by Dan. Any questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mr. Flanagan. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Kantz. Yes. Mr. Mokel. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. Ms. Piper. Yes. Okay, jail 145. We have G161, Cook, negative 19,384.56. H161, Cook, positive 19,384.56. Total, zero. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ryan, second by Dan. 
Any questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Ms. Flanagan. Yes. Ms. Hughes. Yes. Ms. Kantz. Yes. Ms. Burkle. Yes. Ms. Webb. Yes. Ms. Whitehead. Yes. Ms. Piper. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Then we have under other prosecutor lit 1170 B116 receptionist negative 14,745.22 C116 receptionist positive 14,745.22 total transfer is zero. Motion to approve. Second. Right. Motion by Ryan. Second by Dan. Any questions? Hearing none. Roll call, please. Ms. Flanagan. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Kantz. Yes. Mr. Merkel. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. Ms. Piper. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay, next we have transfers under Addendum 2. We have one that falls under County General, Treasurer 127, 104, Head Cashier, negative 12,196.08, 104A, Head Cashier, positive 12,196.08, total transfer is zero. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ryan, second by Dan. Any questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mr. Flanagan. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Pants. Yes. Mr. Mogul. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. Ms. Piper. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Keep moving on. Okay. We're moving into financials. Under County General, we have Corner 242 operating supplies, positive $19,392 for a total of $19,392. And by the way, this has been withdrawn. <laughs> we just got the withdrawal late last night, right, Denise? The corner? Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't get it. I didn't either. I got the EMS withdrawal. The EMS withdrawal. Is okay, this the, stand by. Is this he, the radios? He sent a um, report. You might be right. I don't know. I didn't All right. Um, I will not be able to attend tomorrow's council meeting. My admin will not be there for family emergency. My chief deputy will be at the VA. However, I wanted to send a dashboard. We send a dashboard we need to send out to everyone. Um, additionally, I had a request for an appropriation for radios, but since none of my staff can attend, I respectfully would like to hold off on this issue until July to discuss this further with the council. Okay. Thank you. So, you're welcome. Okay, then we'll go on to election 142. We have 311 legal fees, positive $31,500, total $31,500. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ryan, second by Dan. Any questions? I have some questions. Okay. Um, Mr. Spangler, could you um, kind of give us a rundown on this? I'd, I'd seen some of Matt's notes from finance saying that there is, I know this is about the, um, some of the candidates who were challenged on the ballots and they had sued the election board and this was the total cost for the legal costs. Where I was a little bit, I guess, confused a little bit is in Matt's notes, he said something about it being a city election. So they were, they were actually paying for it. Is that, can you help me understand? Yeah, in a mun municipal election, uh, the clerk, does run that election, but we are running it for the municipalities. So either the city of Muncie or the town of Gaston or Eaton, uh, we are working for them, but they do pay us uh, and we have been reimbursed from the city of Muncie for these expenses on the legal stuff. So that was going to be my next question. So you're saying they've already paid us this 31,000? Yeah, Tanya you can verify that we've already received over $112,000 from the city of Muncie to run their election. Yeah, that's correct. So when, what are we approving thirty one thousand five hundred? So that I can that money does not go back into my budget, that hundred and twelve. So I have to ask for that money to be transferred into my budget so I can pay the legal fees. Okay, okay, I appreciate that. And um, one one more thing, I I didn't realize that this was something that we weren't going to have to pay. So, but one of the things I noticed when I was looking through this, just I guess for any future reference, I don't know if we we used that specific attorney or not, but. I noticed with the itemized list that we get that was given to us that there's a lot of different things listed as, as far as what the attorney did but mm -hmm. nothing is broken down as far as how much time was spent on each thing and how much each dollar amount was for each thing it was just i did these 10 things and it cost thirty one thousand mm dollars -hmm. so i guess just for me 
in the future, if, if we get an invoice like this, for me personally, I'd like to see it broken down more on the, um, ask how much you spend it on each particular issue. Not a problem. Thank you, sir. Will do. I have a question in regards to the legal charges as well. Why, um, if this was balanced at zero, why do we not show a balance of zero on if the money was in and the money was out and the balance now is zero? It's, it's coming from the general fund. He, his, the money he received, that, correct me if I'm wrong, Correctly. the money he received went to the general fund. It did not go to his balance. When now the, the money, money is out. in general fund, he's got to ask for it back oh, out of I general see. fund. Okay. To go to his yeah. they don't deposit that money into my account my accounts there was you know different things we were paid for we bill the the city specifically you know so much for poll workers so much for meals um and so much for legal fees uh, but that money then goes to not the general fund but a reimbursement fund if i understand right so i'm requesting that much money out of that reimbursement fund and i'm going to spend all of that money so that's where we'll get back to zero so one more thing you had said something about other towns that they may do the same so i didn't realize that there's any type of reimbursement so when we have a county election and other towns are included do they shoulder that's, some that's that expense? ours because that's we are ours. the county okay all right since we in this election and since we have no county offices that's why we get the reimbursement okay thanks for explaining mm -hmm. that all right any further questions Hearing none, roll call, please. Ms. Plankin. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Pants. Yes. Mr. Vogel. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. Ms. Piper. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next was withdrawn, the one for EMS for 9,300. Mm -hmm. Withdraw that. And moving on to other, we have Ball Brothers Grant, High Tech Crimes Unit, 9214. 393 training, positive $20,000. 394 renovations, positive $30,000. Total, $50,000. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ryan, second by Dan. Any questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Ms. Flanagan. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Kantz. Yes. Mr. Mogul. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. Ms. Piper. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then we have EMS capital improvements 4910 under 224 uniforms five thousand dollars for a total of five thousand dollars motion to approve second motion by Ryan second by Dan any questions I have a quick question please yep so I was I was um, looking through some of the notes with the finance and I see that these you know these were uniform purchases for uh, like like dress uniforms I guess for for the funeral of a fallen comrade is that is that accurate yes they were um, we purchased class A's for the funeral because it was an inline duty death. So we went through and had to get the class A's to, to do the proper service. Is, um, uh, it's just not something most people would expect or would plan for. So I would assume that's why that you guys didn't already have those uniforms, but with this coming out and this type of situation, it probably wasn't planned for in the future. Is there anything else that in the future, something that we're not expecting to happen that that we're not prepared for as far as like having those uniforms that we can maybe put in your budget to be prepared for? Mm. Um, we had talked about amongst ourselves and stuff. I think what I what I think we would like to do is um, every so often, once you hit a certain level, you know, trying to purchase at least a couple of the class A's a year. So we have them if we need them. God forbid we ever need them again. Um, so I really I really think that would be the best thing for us to do is to to try to at least purchase a couple i mean because we have it was just this was such a massive purchase at one time i mean it it was very expensive because we had to have them overnight shipped and it was a lot more than what we anticipated well, and what would it expected. normally cost normally it would cost 60 percent less but with the shipping and everything we had to pay a lot more thank you any further questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Mr. Lincoln. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Yes. Mr. Kantz. Yes. Mr. Merkel. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Mr. Whitehead. Yes. Mr. Piper. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, under Motor Vehicle Highway 1176, <clears throat> we have 440 equipment, positive $4,691 for a total of $4,691. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ryan, second by Dan. Any questions? Something looking to buy. 
It's a mower head. Oh, okay. Is it? Did I say it's one of the tilt ones to be, like be able to do ditches oh, and stuff? Ditch mower. Can you re-explain the? Um, you had sold equipment, so you, we, this is similar to Rick's thing. Carry from County Highway. We sold some old unused equipment through is it Dove deals or whatever the county goes through, and um, so we're using that money to put towards this new mower head. <clears throat> Let me ask you this when, when obviously we're cycling through equipment all the time we're always buying new equipment get rid of old equipment how would the average citizen know when some equipment's going to be coming up for purchase that they can bid on uh we get with kyle johnson he goes through i'm i'm sorry i said kyle johnson but it's um john casino um we just go through gov deals so it's i not don't like think a we date. put a posting out or anything i know highway doesn't i don't know if john does or not Okay. Yeah, any further questions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Splangan. Yes. Hughes. Yes. Scamps. Yes. Spokal. Yes. Webb. Yes. Quiet. Yes. Piper. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And that concludes that portion of the meeting. Would someone like to make the uh... motion to approve financial transfers and to amend salary ordinance with like reductions? Second. All right, motion by Eugene, second by Dan. Any, well, roll call, please. Ms. Plankin. Yes. Ms. Hughes. Yes. Ms. Camps. Yes. Ms. Mogul. Yes. Ms. Webb. Yes. Ms. Whitehead. Yes. Ms. Piper. Yes. All right, moving on to appointments and committee reports. We do not have any appointments uh, this month. I know I mentioned last month we might, but I was, um, our openings on the CCA board are actually the commissioner's appointments this time, not ours. So. We do not have anything there. Uh, and then Bill has our council rules committee. Thank you. This is the process we started uh, at the beginning of the year um, working with Jane uh, at the beginning. And then Dan uh, agreed to, uh, to fill in to help out. Uh, I think the initial draft of the proposed rules went out in March um and were posted uh on the uh, county website um i brought hard copies last month and and they were available to uh, the council and to the public uh the only um comment i have received in the last 30 days uh was to correct an error in section 6.02 where I had omitted the word hours after 48, um, which is that section provides that ordinances and resolutions need to be distributed to the council, not less than 48 hours before the meeting of which they're to be considered. The whole purpose of this uh, the adoption rules by a county council is provided by state statute. We had a lot of traditions and, and processes uh, that just simply aren't written down anywhere. And um, particularly with a uh, large number of new members of the council, I felt and, and other people encouraged me to pursue this, that it would be appropriate to, to have written rules. Uh, it was not the intention of these to, to change anything in particular, although there are some um, uh, new provisions in here that I don't think we've, we've considered before. We wanted to make sure that we were in compliance with state law. Uh, and of course there, as with any rules, there is a process uh, as we go forward, if we see something we don't like or something that we've uh, not considered in, in these rules, uh, there is an amendment process. Um, but uh, given the, uh, at least the, um, my feeling that, that uh, people seem to have, uh, uh, be reasonably well satisfied with what we've got here, uh, at this point, I would move the adoption of the uh, rules of the Delaware County Council as presented with the uh, one correction. Um, I would note that by the terms of the rules themselves, uh, it would require a affirmative vote of five members in order to adopt the rules. Second. We have a motion by Bill, a second by Eugene. We're open for questions and comments. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I did have a question. Uh, you know, I 
actually prepared to talk about something a little bit different about this, but after some of my feedback that, you know, I'd spoken with some of the council members and, you know, it's no secret, but one of the things that I've been trying to, to get done was the live streaming of our budget meetings. And we all attended, uh, very proud to say that we were one of only two counties who all of us attended the state call conference this weekend. So uh, congratulations everyone for attending that. But with all of us there, we realized that there was a change in state law it said that starting January or uh, July of uh, 2025, that all of the meetings were going to have to be live streamed and archived. We already do all of these meetings, but I'd like to do our budget meetings as well. I feel it's the most important meeting of um, on all the county government. You know, we're, we're deciding how to spend $55 million, and, and it's a little tricky because they're a lot longer. They're a little bit different than just two hours in here. I mean, these go for 12 hours, three days in a row, and then maybe a couple other days for, with uh, an hour or two here and there. Um, that don't start for two more years. Now, I realize that there's some kind of discussions going on as far as um, getting some quotes about how to do that. So it's not necessarily nothing that we can we can do until we get that figured out. I'm just trying to generate some of the conversation going towards that. And my question was, with this rules, um, would it be something that we could amend the rules to include live streaming the budget meetings to have them included into that rules package? Um, just curious of where where people stood on that if there's any support for that or, or or if we'll just take this and wait and see what happens i know we're going to discuss some other things um, in the future on it but i just I, since you said last night that you were going to adopt or move to adopt these today i thought this is a good time to at least bring it up and see if this is something we want to include in the rules or or not we don't include the uh fact that we're doing them now in the rules so i don't see why we need to muddy up the rules by adding the stuff that we already do well, I, I guess I'll share this just so everyone's aware of what the process is. I know I talked to Ryan about it, so uh, we had to wait for a um, quote. And once we got that, we could start to move forward. We can't make an a, you know, appropriation or a transfer if we don't have a quote. We don't know what we're working with. Um, and as Ryan mentioned before, all of us attended this uh, conference this past weekend. So we have some monies that we've spent out of con contractual services there, too. So we're waiting to make sure we know what's still available, whether it needs to be a transfer or an appropriation. So things are moving. It's just there's a process and it can't just, you know, happen overnight. So that's kind of where that stands at the moment. I also talked to Ryan about the uh, potentially adding this to the rules. I'm not in agreement. I think that for the rules specific for the process and we don't know exactly what's going to happen, that today we should adopt the rules. We can always amend the rules, as Bill said, after once that process is completed to the live stream information is available and we know that we're moving forward with it, then we'll add that or potentially could add that down the road. But I think it's important that we get this in today if possible. I'm glad you actually brought that up about the amendment. Bill, could you, could you educate me on that? Is there any length of time we have to wait for an amendment? Like no. if we adopt the rules, we don't have to like wait six months to do an amendment. We can no. do it at any time. Okay. Fair enough. That's provided in um, uh, 8.02. The rules may be amended 30 days prior written notice in order to pro pro propose an amendment, uh, but then, uh, and, and it would also require the affirmative vote of five members. Same, uh, the same voting requirement. Uh, yeah, I think, I think it's important uh, that people know about House Enrolled Act 1167 um, that will require that all meetings of this body be either live streamed or if that's not possible recorded and and posted and maintained uh, as archive copies so um, this will does not become effective until july 1 2025 we're already i think ahead of the game because all of our regular meetings are live streamed at this point and uh, subject to the budget and, and finding the money uh, i it's perfectly appropriate in my view to, to live stream the budget meetings as well uh, the, oh, go ahead. Sorry, and Bill, there's clarity in there too. It's only meetings that are held in this chamber, correct? Correct. No, not for this body. No, all meetings of this body. No, but other uh, uh, bodies, and what comes to mind, Delaware County is the Plan Commission, because they meet in this room. Those meetings will have to be live streamed which they are, I don't think they are presently. <clears throat> if they 
continue to meet here. If they continue to be here. Right, they can they can move. Very quickly, the county executive will always have to be live streamed its meetings. The county council will always have to live stream its meetings. And then the room in which those take place, any other body that meets in that room will have to also live stream. If they just so happen to meet elsewhere regularly or for a specific purpose, they meet somewhere else other than here, then they would not have to live stream that meeting. But the executive and the legislature will always have to. So I, I guess, so if there's other costs associated with any of that, we need to be delving into that. Well, and that's the commissioners with their, yeah. their contracts. So I'm sure they're aware of this law that will be coming into place here soon. So we'll want to make sure that the budget is appropriately for the 2025 if not getting ahead of the game and doing it before it's mandated but yeah that would be part of that contract okay um <clears throat> when we were talking before about getting a book is that something that we have to have more than one bid or we could just take the bid and the commissioners put it on the agenda and go I thought that's their lane yeah. so okay so for us it would just be knowing how much it is and, and whether we want to vote to appropriate out of county general or if we make a transfer, which is what I'm hoping we can do. Okay. I, I was hopeful we have that line item for contractual services, and I'm hopeful that there's enough money in there to pay for it, so it wouldn't even require a transfer. Right. Sure. Well, hopefully we right, have all that's that. In the by next month's meeting, and maybe we can have a discussion about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, good question. All right. Roll call, please. Ms. Flanagan. Yes. Ms. Hughes. Yes. Ms. Gantz. Yes. Ms. Twinkle. Yes. Ms. Webb. Yes. Ms. Whitehead. Yes. Ms. Piper. Yes. All right, moving on to new business. Uh, we have uh, Together DM plan. We'll have you guys up first. Great job on those, by the way, though. Good morning, Council. Mitch Isaacs here on behalf of Muncie Action Plan, where I serve as the board president, and I'm joined by my colleague and Muncie Action Plan vice president, Heather Williams. As a reminder, Muncie Action Plan is a not-for-profit organization, approximately 10 years old, started um, in order to be the community's grassroots plan about two and a half years ago. 2021. Um, we partnered with the Muncie Delaware County Planning Commission to start not only the next iteration of the Muncie Action Plan, but the next countywide master plan. So um, led and supported by Marta Moody, we were we selected a uh, consultant to help us through that process. Uh, we had to do it during the pandemic. So we worked hard to get a variety of community feedback and folks involved in that plan. The mayor was on the planning team among many other folks. Um, that plan was passed and adopted in 2022 by the county commissioners, by the city council, and again, the mayor was one of the folks on the steering committee. Um, since that plan was passed, Muncie Action Plan spent last year reorganizing itself in order to align with that plan. And then we were excited in 2023 to begin work on the plan. And then, as we all know, unfortunately, we lost our colleague, our friend, and the executive director of the planning commission, Marta Moody. And we were really counting on Marta uh, to help lead us through the portion of the plan that specifically relates to the county. And so after Marta's passing, we gave the Planning Commission and the county some time to um, reorganize and, and figure out how to work without Marta. We're all still figuring out how to work without Marta. And we approached the commissioners and asked for edit funds to support um, moving the plan forward, specifically to get more folks from the county involved in the county portion of the plan. When you look at the plan, it's really two plans. It's the plan for the county. And then nestled in that plan is the Muncie Strategic Investment Plan, specifically focused on the Muncie city limits. Muncie Action Plan is really mostly invested on the Muncie Strategic Investment Plan because it's Muncie Action Plan. Um, but we also have some responsibility in getting the Together DM countywide portion of the plan. And we really want to make sure that the county is well represented. Obviously, Muncie Action Plan um, has great connections within the city of Muncie. But we are approaching the county commissioners and we're approaching this body for nominations to help join the steering committee to advance the Together DM plan. And so we met with the commissioners a few weeks ago 
they supplied about ten thousand dollars in edit funds so we could start bringing people together and organizing that we asked them for recommendations of folks they want to see um on that steering committee uh, president piper was at that meeting i think a few other members of this council um, was as well as well so i press approach president piper and, and asked if we could come here and ask for your recommendations on the steering committee the plan's already passed it's already done it's already moving forward so this is about asking you who you all as a group would like to see on that steering committee obviously you you're probably not in a space to make those recommendations today so what we wanted to do was just broach the subject with you answer your questions about the plan in hopes that in the next couple of weeks we can get recommendations from both the county commissioners and the county council so we can start organizing the together dm plan and we can make sure that the county is appropriately recognized and advancing the plan and moving it forward so all pause heather and i are happy to answer any questions how many members are you seeking or the commissioners and the council together a number or are we both doing our own yeah what? you're both doing your okay. own um we've never done anything like this before right so how long is a piece of string is really the question so i don't want to see a committee any more than probably 10 or 12 people it gets a little unwieldy after that okay. uh, we have a handful of people from muncie action plan who are going to serve we asked the commissioners for about five three, four, five, whatever number you think makes sense. Okay. Commissioner King had mentioned maybe, um, and I don't think that they're they're settled on this, but he proposed having a representative from each town. Um, so they may go that direction. I'm less interested in the number. I don't want it to be huge. I'm more interested in the, the populations or demographics you all think need to be represented. This is the county's plan. And so we approach the, the local government and ask, who do you think needs to be represented in advancing this plan so if you all you know um, I'm sure you've seen the plan and um, you know looked at the plan but in reviewing it again if you all have recommendations you think well we really want six people because we want six folks from these different areas that's fine by us we just don't want a group that's too large to get anything done and I know Commissioner Reagan had mentioned in that meeting too about maybe looking at the neighborhoods in the unincorporated county as She's well speaking so, to my heart there. Right, I know yeah. that's us well it used to be <laughs> used to be used to be yeah well <clears throat> Mr. Isaac, I appreciate you coming and, and asking us to participate and, and, you know, get recommendations. I have a question. Um, you mentioned something about uh, what Commissioner King said about one in each town. Um, so demographics, are you expecting the county to stick with nominating people who live in the county? Right? Because the city obviously seems yes. to be pretty well represented already. So yeah. Try to keep it outside of city limits as far as recommendations that's the thought if there's someone that lives that happens to live in the city of muncie who you think is especially well connected in county business we wouldn't want to disqualify that person but we really are primarily looking for you all to address folks out of city limits muncie the action plan just has good strong relationships there and we already have folks invested in the muncie portion thank you hey mitch the the outcomes here that are under the blue is that are those the goals so those are the outcomes that we're looking to achieve yeah. through the work of the Together DM plan. So um, I didn't include in there the baseline. So they do also give us a baseline of what the of where we're starting. Like um, with total assessed value of real estate in Delaware County, you're looking at six billion dollars per capita income. Um, uh, households that are earning less than twenty five thousand in the county are almost thirty percent of households, and then the share of adults with associate degree or higher. Uh, the U.S. is 40 percent and Delaware County is 33.5. So it's a matter of rising all of that, or rising all of those numbers. Awesome. So what makes a good person? <laughs> That's great <laughs> to be serving on this. Heather? Well, we so as Mitch said, we have really good connections within city limits, right? So if you look at the folks who are um, who are listed under um, the map board members that are included, Mitch and I are, are listed there just because we're we're kind of more the the, the staff, like the leading folks. Um, but you've got Wayne Johnson um, from uh, Ivy Tech. You've got Jenny Marsh from United Way, Marcy Minton from the uh, Community Foundation, Missy Modisette from By Five, and Chuck Reynolds from Muncie Community Schools. So those are people that are connected to initiatives within the plan. So if you look at the plan, um, the the Delaware County. Um, comprehensive plan is looking at improving quality of place. It's looking at strengthening housing conditions and options and expanding opportunities for upward mobility. So education, workforce development, um, you know, developers, housing, um, parks, um, connective corridors, those types of things for improving quality of place. So if you if you feel that there are people in the county that are are really knowledgeable in those areas, that would probably be most helpful. 
um, or that they're good connectors. Like they know their community well. So they, they're good at bringing people together to have conversations because this is just one piece of the puzzle. The coalition is gonna be you know, higher level thinking, but then these, these individuals are gonna be going back out into their communities and having conversations and having meetings. And um, this is gonna be a trickle down effect of you know, making the work happen at the grassroots level, but the coalition will be leading the overall you know, force of moving the plan forward. Oh, there's definitely appreciate some. Them. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I appreciate the, the detail that makes it helpful too. I'd like that you listed some of these the things for the outcomes down below. Uh, Jessica and I was just actually talking about this over the weekend. What you say? We're like sixth rank out of 92 yeah, counties. Out of the 92 counties, the, bottom. the last time I looked at the census data, we were sixth from the bottom for the lowest household median income. And the last time I looked, Delaware County had a poverty rate of like 22.45%, something around, you know, and it's, when you, you know, you live, when you don't live in it, you don't necessarily see it all the time, right? Like our communities, we don't necessarily see it and you start looking at the numbers and it's, it's eye opening. Yeah. Uh, it truly is. So, yeah. So what you guys are doing is definitely a need for it. So uh, kudos to you guys for organizing it. So would you like those recommendations by our next meeting then? That would, if you're able to do that, okay. that would be great. Thank you. We'll make that our priority then. So council be thinking of folks that you know that would be a good fit for this initiative and people who will be committed to, uh, how often will they meet? Are you guys meeting monthly? What, what's your schedule? We've got to figure that out. Um, so once we have all of the folks for the committee, then the committee will do the work of organizing and assembling. So um, that'll be, I think bi-monthly will probably be more likely. Okay. Every other month, if that's bi-monthly. Just want to make sure we yeah. have, you know, an idea of what their commitment would look like. So, yeah. All right. Thank you guys you. are really just getting going. We are, yeah. we, you know, losing Marta, um, it hurt. It was huge. It was huge. It was really her office that commissioned the plan. So Thank you. I think if we're done with this topic, am I up next for Shape Leadership are. Academy? <laughs> okay, so uh, Heather's handing that out. Um, switching hats, Mitch Isaac's now Executive Director of Schaefer Leadership Academy. Uh, just wanted to come briefly, I asked President Piper for the opportunity to talk about our Go Serve program. And so um, GoServe is a part of our effort and initiative to get more citizens in the community really keyed in in three ways. We want to see more citizens involved on in not-for-profit boards, government boards, and then in neighborhood associations. And so um, GoServe, I felt like, was relevant to this group because what it exists to do is for citizens to raise their hand and say, I want to serve on boards and commissions. I want to be involved in the business of county government. Maybe I, I don't want to run for office. That might be too much, but I want to know what's happening in my community and I want to have a say so. So what GoServe is, it's very simple. Um, we have about a little over 100 people who have raised their hand. They go on, they say on the form, here's some information about myself. Here are the kinds of boards and commissions I'm interested in. Here's where I live. Here's my political affiliation because we know that that's often a requirement on government boards and commissions. Um, and then it's a service to you all as elected officials, to the county council, to the commissioners, to the mayor, and to city council. So when appointment time comes again, usually I know in December, you can go to that. We have the password that we can supply to you. Uh, you can sort through and you can find someone. We know it's often hard for elected officials to have to fill those appointments. You're usually going towards people you know, and that's great, but there are a whole lot of people out there in the community that you might not know who may want to serve. Another important piece of this is we not only want more people serving on government boards and commissions, we want more diverse folks serving on boards and commissions. We have part-time staff known as community inclusion ambassadors who are working to get different kinds of people on boards and commissions. So we have a community inclusion ambassador for people of color. We have a community inclusion ambassador for folks with disabilities. We have a community inclusion ambassador from the LGBTQ plus community. What those ambassadors do is they go specifically to those communities and encourage them to sign up for government boards and commissions, not for profit um, boards, and also neighborhood associations. Now, the, the database doesn't just have folks from those communities. It has a wide range of people, and that's the idea, is we really want to see the leadership of this county reflect the diversity of this county. So I just wanted to come and let you know that that is a service available to you from Schaefer Leadership Academy. Uh, we've had questions about that. All we do is manage the database. We give you access. You can use the folks on there and you can ask for people um, on that list or you don't have to. It really is just a resource available to you. Uh, we are working hard to make sure there's a variety of people on that list so we can make sure the community is well represented and we hope that you see it as a resource. 
Now, I do have a question for you. So a lot of the, mo many of the boards that we will point to do have a political balance. Is the political affiliation also available there? Or do we need to go look that up? Yeah, so okay. full disclosure, this is still new. We didn't have that question when we st first started it. <laughs> so we like we should have. That was an oversight. So we added that question. Um, so there aren't as many people on there that have political aff affiliation. We added it. I think at the beginning of this year, so we, we have it for probably 20 of the 100 people on there. So that is a bit of a limitation, okay. um, but it is a problem we've corrected. And right now it's about a 60-40 split between Democrats and Republicans out of the 20 who have told us their affiliation. Okay. And we do tell the folks when they sign up that their information will be available to you as elected officials, because it does include their contact information and their political affiliation. Folks often don't want that information to be public, so they know that the only people who really get access to that is the elected officials. Because we trust you to be judicious with their information. <laughs> Mitch, I would point out in the rules we just adopted, uh, we, we have outlined a process that we will use and it requires that the county auditor is going to compile a list of all the open positions on boards and commissions in October. Oh, great. So that we would have the opportunity to solicit uh, applications, publicize it, solicit applications, and be in a position then to make appointments in December for for positions that begin January 1st. Well, that's, that's really great to hear, Bill. And if it's appropriate and desired, we would love to help you promote that. You know, our goal is the local leadership academy is not only to train folks to lead, but help people get involved. And we think getting involved in local government is an important way for citizens to get engaged. So when that time comes, um, Bill, if, if President Piper or whoever wants to reach out to us, we'd be happy to help you promote that. As I said, we already have 100 people who have raised their hands and said they want to serve. And so um, I hope, my hope is that for you, for the commissioners, for city council and the mayor, this is a resource. So you can just go on a database and look when you're trying to fill those appointments and reach out to folks who, who might be good folks to serve and make your job easier as elected officials and help people who want to get involved be involved. So in, in some ways, that's true. The flip side is if you're able to promote it or to distribute what's available, can you guys distribute it to everybody on that list? Absolutely. Okay. We sure can. We can also send it out to our, our mailing list that has over 2,000 people. Well, because ultimately, like, going through 100 names and trying to contact them, like, who's going to do it? Like, that will, that takes time and effort. So I think that's part of the reason why sometimes it doesn't get done. You know what I mean? Great point, Matt. What I will tell you is that all this stuff ports into an Excel document. So if you want to filter by political affiliation, by gender, I don't remember if we ask race or not, the kinds of boards they want to serve on. So yes, it is 100 names, but it is sortable and filter by Excel. So if you just know a couple of the qualities you're looking for, with a couple of mouse clicks, it can go from 100 to 5 really quick. One of the Excel is my love language, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. One of the things, um, I've, I've, always, I've noticed that the city's done this for a couple of years. I've always kind of admired from a distance the way that they've done that process. I don't know if you're aware of it all, but since, since I've got elected, one of the main things I've tried to promote is getting uh, more citizens involved in local boards and committees. Um, sometimes certain boards and committees, they tend to have the, the same people, although, the, you know, we thank them for, for contributing and, and, you know, God bless them for giving up their time. I tend to subscribe to the theory that I, I like to see new people coming in and out of those boards and committees. Um, so what I've found in promoting these, these um, like, what Bill said, we have it in the rules here coming up. I had been trying to promote our uh, open board and committee seats for the last two years, a month or two in advance. And what I found is there's tons of people out there who want to get involved. They just don't know how to do it. That's right. They don't know who to contact. They don't know how to throw their name and their hat in the ring. Uh, so I think this is a, a great program and I appreciate you coming and bringing it to our attention. And, and I hope I hope the county does something with it because uh, I think it can be very beneficial. We hold monthly information nights. We just had one last night, small, but about 10 people who showed up that wanted to learn more specifically about government boards, not-for-profit boards, and neighborhood associations. And we do that every month. And so we're, we're here. I think we're all rolling, rolling in the same direction. So I just wanted to let you know it was a resource. It's available, and we're here to do the work, and, and we hope that you see it as helpful to your work. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. Have a good morning. You too. Thanks, Thank Mitch. You. All right. Moving on. So again, just a reminder, next meeting, let's try to have our, our ideas together on five county folks to uh, provide to the 
together, DM. Uh, moving on to microvote. Rick, you're up. Rick Spangler, Delaware County Clerk. Um, I'm going to be putting in the budget for next year new voting machines for Delaware County. Our current machines are 20 years old. They were brought to us by Clerk Karen Winger, if you remember when Karen was back. And we've got just about all the good we can get out of those machines. Uh, in the last two elections, we've had one machine in each election that has come up with a fatal error. We were luckily able to fix those. And, you know, nothing was lost. There was no problem. But it is time that we start looking at new machinery. Um, so this morning, I brought Steve Shamo from Microvote to tell you a little bit about the new machines. We've had a lot of changes. We've got a lot of new equipment. Some of what was bought by the state, but these actual voting machines, we'll have to, to pay for ourselves. But Steve will tell you about that. We've also got one set up down in the uh, Commissioner's Conference Room on the second floor. So I'd love for you to come down on your way out and just take a minute or two and look at what we're doing and, and you know, the need for this change. But right now, let Steve talk to you. I, uh, I get my name Steve Shama with Microvote. Um, I've been your representative since 2006 when um, you purchased the Microvote Infinity system. Give you the timeline on that. Prior to that, your previous voting system was kind of a low maintenance um, system, but the state required and mandated a change of that system to get to something away from punch card and lever voting machines. And so in that in that year, the state funded that purchase and was approximately I think about $680,000. So all the years of your previous system up to that point really were funded all the way up until 2016-ish, which is when the county reinvested about 20 cents on that $680,000 purchase to upgrade your voting equipment for another 10-year life expectancy and expansion of that voting system. So it's been from the standpoint of equipment purchase been a pretty low threshold for several decades now. Um, what Rick was discussing is essentially the new panel for the voting system. There's three key components to the voting system that's going to go into place for the presidential election next year is going to be mandated by the state. The first and most important piece is the voting panel itself. The second piece is the least expensive, which is the booth. And the third piece is the VVPAT, which is the voter verifiable paper audit trail, which is mandated for use for that general election. So far, the state has already purchased a number of those for you, and they are completing the purchase of the booth and the VVPAT for the county. Um, substantial price tag on that that the state has picked up for you is already paid for. Now it's just a matter of production and delivery, getting it in place. The third component, the microvote infinity panel itself has been upgraded in the last few years. And um, functionality for the voter and the poll workers is essentially exactly the same. We still use the same sort of smart card technology to activate the voting machine for the for the voter itself. But the substantial difference is is the screen presentation itself. Um, those of you who voted on it know these screens are getting a little older and faded through the process. So the new screen is kind of a crisp display that you would expect in this era, color activated. So now when the voter makes their selection, rather than simply getting a gray X next to the name, the entire voting location will light up with a green bar across it. I find it to be the most important um, for your body because of Senate Bill 56 and the requirement of detaching the county council at large race away from the straight party vote um, becomes very um, confusing with no great cues for the voter. But in this situation now, if the voter were to make an activation for Republican or Democrat straight party activation and then scroll through the ballot, which is required by law to view every screen, when they would get to that county council at large position, they would in fact see no green selection whatsoever, a void on that office and any others. So it really highlights that. And um, and I believe also you're going to see if, if um, the legislative trends continue down the road. There is a, um, a lot of discussion about attaching Republican and Democrat monikers to school board races in future elections. And that too would require a deactivation or a detachment from the straight party voting, highlighting those offices also. Um, so anyway, the, what Rick is proposing is, uh, is putting into the budget, you currently have 239 voting machines. The cost of the panel itself, if you were to replace one for one on that, would come in at about $669,000 for those panels. They're $2,800 a piece. Um, Rick has um, brought up several times since they've gone to vote centers, is there the need for that same number of, of machines? 
Um, currently, we've the, the most we've put out in your elections over the years in the general elections, you know, I just call it Christmas mass. It's when people haven't seen in a while show up. They get down to about 220 to 223 that we put out and about 15 to 19 are held back for various regions. If, if we see that this district in particular was going to have a hot race, we might put additional equipment in that location. The vote center trend, um, magnificent choice by the county to start moving towards that. Um, it, it, it doesn't necessarily decrease the amount of equipment, maybe a little bit, but what it does is it reallocates some of those election day voting machines to a higher purpose. For instance, um, we reduce the number of election day sites. We need large volumes of equipment at them, but the vote center plan mandates um, expansion of your advanced voting. And you will see in the trend will probably happen over the next two to six years. You will probably be accounting for about 50% of all votes cast will come in those early voting periods. The, the upside of that is the value of each voting machine that escalates because on an election day, you can get about 240 to 280 votes on a voting machine. If everyone's given their legal three minutes behind the machine over a 12 hour period. But with advanced voting, you might see a voting machine recording anywhere from 1,500 to 4,500 votes in that process. So the machine itself just gives you a better bang for the buck. So the, the last look that we would look at would probably be um, it, within Rick's budget uh, requesting for the total amount for 239 machines, but then in the process over the next few months, meet with the, the election board in Rick's office and really try to see if we can bring that number down to, you know, the 220, 223 range and not have a bunch of equipment just sitting around at, at no cost. So can you mix and match what's there today versus the with new? Well, yes. And so when we, when the state initiated the purchase of the booth and the VV pad, one of the, re, the design requirements that I insisted upon was to create a, uh, a cavity, which you'll see down in the other room that facilitates both voting machines. Um, so the voting machines that you currently have, the current plan, if the, if the board does not appropriate the money and we don't move towards this machine, your current voting machines will fit in and be conjunction with the um, with the uh, um, the booth and the VV pad. To answer your question, yes, they can. You can mix and match, um, but what what microvote and and myself prefer is rather than mixing and matching, extending the payments for the system over a couple years, um, and getting all the equipment in place so we're uniform in the election. Rather than saying let's buy some this year and some the next year, we would rather see splitting the payment for the simple reason that it just makes the training dramatically easier because now all the poll workers are being trained on the same platform is, and the material. Is this VV pad, is that what you call it? Is that a straight printout that somebody's going to receive and walk away with? Uh, no, it actually stays with the machine. So what it is, is um, it's a black box of sorts that's physically attached to the electronic voting machine. Which is what, what you had in the clerk downstairs. Yes, we used them in early voting. So what the, the purpose of it is, is um, there's two types of audits for voting equipment. One is called a polling audit, which is handles your paper basis. It gets you pretty far, but the combination of the electronic machine and the VV pad is really the gold standard of auditing a voting system. And VSTOP, which is a voting, six, uh, voting system technology oversight panel out of Ball State, they conduct audits around the state. Your system's been audited in other counties now probably 14 times. But what they're able to do is through this crazy logarithm, I won't go too deep into it. The logarithm that they use says go to voting machine number X and pull out ballot 359. And they will view what the electronic um, image was that the voter saw and cast. And then we go to the paper roll and we're able to retrieve that same ballot into a physical separate comparison and prove that the electronic voting machine is tabulating accurately. We also just had our first recount in Warwick County where the VV pad was actually used. So state law now allows for the use of that paper trail as part of a recount tool. Any discrepancies in that recount? No, no. Well, there was, but it was clerical on the, the board. Anytime it, recounts require a hand tabulation of everything. So you're almost given a clerical mm -hmm. error somewhere along the way, but then through retabulation and reexamination of the paper then they were spot on. Answer your question, sir. You said that yourself, as a representative of Microvote, and Microvote itself doesn't support 
phasing in new machines. However, you said that you would, if I'm hearing this correctly, you would rather phase in payments. So if I'm understanding that correctly, are you saying that you would provide all of the machines for let's say half the payment this year and half the payment next year? It would be half the payment next year and then 2025. We try to shoot for more around 60% of it. And then we, we sit on some of the initial costs of the equipment um, ourselves and we eat that for a year and then come back the following year and put it into play. Is there an added expense for any county who would do that? No, we don't, the, we don't ever want to be a bank. We just, we, we try to we recoup, recoup the majority of the manufacturing cost itself. And voting equipment is different than most because, you know, like, you know, here we're talking in decades rather than years. And this, um, and so, no, it doesn't really affect us that much as long as the ball keeps rolling. Do you take away the need to phase them in? Yes. So, yes. Because really the only reason to phase them in would be financial reasons. And yeah. you're saying you could pay us the rest later. Yes. And I, I've done the poll worker classes personally for every year since 2006, except for one class I had to miss. And, um, and anyone that's done poll worker classes mm -hmm. knows that the uniformity is really important. Um, so you're not saying, okay, precincts one through 30, you're doing it this way and, and this way, because everyone that's worked elections knows that the last minute we start shuffling poll workers just to facilitate where they're going to be. Did, but you it's indicate, been a, did you indicate that the state's going to mandate these new machines by a, be in effect by a certain year? Not the new machine, not the new panel that we're discussing for cost, but the paper trail device. Yes, that's mandated for the presidential 2024, and they're picking up the cost on that mandate. Um, the new booth, it comes with a lot of positives, but it, there's also some negatives to it. Um, the new booth weighs about 50 pounds. We have some different transportation issues. That's where the vote center plan comes in key. We have fewer locations to get the equipment to. Um, the upside of it is the setup for the poll worker is dramatically easier. Now it's just simply one power cord, everything fires up and goes. So there's give and, there's give and take with it, um, but it is a bigger space eater. Um, when we're in, there's a lot of discussion with Rick in terms of facilitating that too. Yeah, I've been a poll worker for 20 plus years and, and uh, I know Jim has worked the polls as well. That, uh, I've always been uh, uh, very grateful for microvote and the, the training that we get, the, the reliability of the machines. And I'm certainly any electronic device in the last 20 years has got my vote. So I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. And I believe that, that that's a, usually the first question that comes up is what can we expect out of this voting system, you know, in terms of longevity. You know, we've had 20 years, but the um, I think this new device is actually going to be easily on par, if not a little further, because of the type of processor that's used. The old one still has a processor that generates heat. <laughs> it is, as any, many people know, the machines can get a little warm, but now we're more into cell phone technology rather than laptop technology. So it's a substantial leap. I can remember switching over from the old ballot cards to the other, and I was never so happy. Tabulating the old ballot cards was a nightmare, and I inevitably had to bring them in, and it was, it was all there. It was all right. Just trying to tabulate it correctly, we'd mess up, and they'd fix it. They chose right where we messed up. Usually I could tell them where I messed up. I just didn't know how to fix it. <laughs> and when we went to the push buttons, you're out of there. Well, and I, and I really hope that, and we've seen that the, the counties that have used the paper trail device at full capacity, like Tippecanoe County and Steuben County, um, the voter confidence level goes up dramatically, especially after you go through an audit. You can request the audit. In fact, we, re we requested an audit for this past election, but we pulled out of it because it just wasn't substantial enough to really do a validation of the overall system. So I know it's Rick's intention to um, contact VV Stop and put yourselves in line for a good audit of the voting system. And I would really prefer that that's done after the uh, presidential primary next year so we can go into the presidential general with a full head of steam and, comp and community confidence in the system. I have a question for Rick. You said this will be in the budget for this fall. Are you putting the whole amount in or the 60-40 situation? Uh, I'm putting the full amount in. I was not aware of that possibility um, prior to talking to Steve this morning. So, you know, I, I will put it in. As you know, the council can adjust it in there. 
uh, you know, and uh, we'll get some more exact numbers for you, mm -hmm. you know, by by the uh, budget meetings. But I was just I'm up against it with having to turn in my budget yeah. right away. So and they're due Friday. Yeah, everybody should remember. You gotta take your shot. So I appreciate you putting it in there. And, and for accounting the size too, I'd also recommend that normally the warranty on the equipment is one year, but I would, um, if I were you, I'd insist on four years. And it doesn't, it doesn't cost us anything necessarily, but I just think it's a nice comfort zone for one full election cycle because we we use it, and then we we don't use it for a complete year. And then the last thing I have to say is that we we have a 20 week lead time on the equipment. And so if this budget is approved in September, um, we, we, it will be highly possible to get it in place for the primary election, the panels in for the election, for the primary. But if not, then it would definitely be in place for the general election. Great. Do you have any further questions? And we'll be downstairs in the room. Um, Amy and the public are welcome to also come down and take a look at it. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. One last thing I'd like to say is about microvotes. You know, we not only buy the machines from them, we get them to help us. They're with us every election. Uh, they're on top of the machinery. If we have a problem during the day, they're here and they actually go out to the machine. So, so we're not just buying, you know, the machine, we're buying the company. How many uh, counties in the state do you guys uh, serve? Six. We uh, tabulate votes for approximately, I think it's about 68% of all the votes cast in the state. Are on this equipment. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And we are out of Indianapolis, Indiana. All right. Well, moving on to elected officials and department heads. We have any elected? We do have an elected. Well, yeah, department well, heads. Look. Yeah, maybe the maybe a first. This year. I'm not <laughs> sure. Uh, good morning, Council. Jeff Hanser, Chief Probation Officer, Delaware County Probation. I'm uh, here to give the Council an update on our. Uh, jump program that we've uh, started this year out of the Delaware County Adult Probation Department. Before I do that, I wanted to let you know and the public as well, this Thursday from noon to 5 p.m., the uh, uh, JDAI program that we run out of our juvenile department in conjunction with the Muncie Police Department is hosting a free family uh, fun swim at Tui Pool from uh, noon to 5. So if, uh, you know, bring the kids out and uh, have a fun day. I think the weather will be nice, nice that day. So um, please feel free to attend that. That's a free event. Um, so I'm here to give an update on the jump program. This is a, a offender employment program we started this year out of the probation department. Many of the council members were supportive of this as we were ramping up last year, uh, trying to get this going. So we're going to give you the six month update. Um, overall, we're very uh, enthused about the progress we've made so far, having a lot of good positive impact uh, on many of our clients, and we're looking forward to the next six months. The economic impact is probably the biggest one. Uh, this really program was designed to do a few things. One was to get uh, reduce the recidivism of our folks that are on probation, give, give them employment, and also to address the uh, work, work shortages uh, that employers have locally. So uh, that's been, that's going really well. Uh, you know, we've asked some economists to do some analysis thus far uh, where we are. I, I've kind of done my own on chat GPT, the AI. That's my favorite. Yeah, and it, it actually did a pretty good job. It indicated if we had 50, uh, 50 folks employed at $15 an hour for a year, that's $1.5 million in wages that they would receive. Um, and then the you know, obviously there's a direct tax benefit to the local jurisdiction of the state as well uh, in terms of payroll taxes, but also the money that gets spent in the community, there's some uh, ways, ways to analyze the, the, the broader economic impact. But uh, more than that, this also, uh, like I said, reduces recidivism of uh, offenders, it increases public safety, um, and kind of one of the biggest pieces out of this is that it's really promoted good collaboration, especially between our department and uh, Ivy Tech uh, College. Uh, Chancellor Scott and his team's been very instrumental in, in being supportive, and a lot of our folks have been able to go on to get uh, certifications, white belt certifications, uh, tow, tow truck certifications, a lot of different things to help improve their station in life, which is exactly what we wanted. So. Um, Bigger than that, from my perspective, this is a positive solution. We deal a lot of times in probation with a lot of 
problems. Folks have a lot of struggles and barriers to get um, where they we want to see them in life. Um, but uh, uh, this is a good example of how we can develop solutions in house in the county. And th there's actually an output from it. So in other words, you know, I'll be back up here in front of you all in like a couple, two or three months. Um, a lot of times when we're receiving funding for whether it's position or resources, you know, there's an input, but in this case, the output is far out uh, exceeding at this point what the input is. So I just want to reiterate that. Um, we're just, uh, you know, we're just looking, appreciate the support that we've got from the council and everyone this far. And our coordinator, uh, Emily Stoltz, can give you a little bit of a breakdown on the numbers on the sheet she just uh, handed out to you. Good morning. Like Jeff said, my name is Emily Stoltz. I'm the Employment and Education Services Coordinator um, for the JUMP program. So we started in January, like Jeff said, so we're six months in. And we've seen a lot of growth, a lot more clients than we ever thought we would see. Um, right now, we're looking at 217 total clients. This includes um, every category. So people who are in green, yellow, and red placement, people who are waiting to be placed, um, people who have been discharged, people whose information we're holding, and people who have graduated. Um, so we're at around 217 in June, which is very good. That's, we did not expect that at all. Um, and now we're looking at about 78 people who are looking to be placed. So um, they're essentially waiting on employment. We're sending them places to go apply. Um, we're working with them right now, every day. And then we have 41 people who are actively working, um, which is a good improvement from March, which was when our last quarterly report came out. So um, that's kind of the number side of stuff. Um, talking about the collaboration side with Ivy Tech, they come out to probation three times a week. So. Um, our, their work matters liaison, Stacy Bell, she comes out and we work together in my office. We sign people up for jump and we sign them up for college credit class that they take. So it kind of gives them the whole experience of people investing in them and us showing them that we're going to help them out. So Ivy Tech's been great. We've also collaborated with the Muncie Manufacturing Alliance. Um, we go to every meeting they have. We work with a lot of people who are involved in the alliance. So that's kind of the collaboration piece of stuff. So. Where are a good chunk of these folks getting jobs at? Um, our biggest employer right now is Arrowhead Plastics. They've worked really well with us. Um, and we have Arrowhead Plastics. I've been sending people to AZZ lately. Um, and also, I would like to say we are kind of transitioning, and John Bush will talk about this a little more. We're transitioning out of only manufacturing. Um, we're kind of trying to get more jobs as well. So we've rebranded, and like I said, John will talk about that. but. Arrowhead Plastics is a big one, um, Magna, places like that. So all types of manufacturing, all types of places. So great. Yeah. Good morning, Council. Uh, Good, morning. Good morning. Thank you for having us. I'll be brief and to kind of uh, extend the accolades uh, and the excitement that we have in the probation department. Uh, we're moving forward with the JUMP program. I, I, I began the program, and, and I'm the program author uh, in uh, program development. Uh, and I've worked with a lot of stakeholders in getting this off the ground. It's been kind of a dream of mine since I started in my career back in uh, January of 07. So what, what Emily spoke of about the rebranding, we kind of looked at it with the way the manufacturing sector was slowing down in the wintertime and early, early uh, start of um, uh, 2023, we started seeing positions start to dry up. So we started seeing more need in other sectors of employment in Delaware County with hospitality, food service, um, customer service industries, the union, um, uh, construction outfits, uh, various other employers, uh, call service centers, uh, Pizza King. Uh, we, we, we've we seen a need from, I mean, they're calling us. They're seeing the news articles. They're, we're getting published in national magazines on what we're doing. Um, Manufacturing Dive just did a really good article, and I can send the council by email a link to that article um, about the progress we're making. Uh, some of our manufacturing employers, uh, like North American Stamping Group, they had a really good story about one of our clients that actually changed the way that they operate their machines because he was doing such a good job that his failure rate on parts and the manufacturing of parts went down so low that they've now redesigned their protocols for their workstation for those machines because of what our client was doing that efficiency. So that's a really big success story um, that we've seen come out of the program. And that individual is actually featured in the, the newspaper. 
Um, and so we've rebranded the name, aside from just uh, capturing the manufacturing sector, we decided to open this up to all employers in Delaware County and all sectors. So we've rebranded our name uh, to the, instead of the Judicial Users Manufacturing Partnership, we decided that it just is much better suited to our mission to call it the Judicial um, Upward Mobility Partnerships. And what that does is that opens the doors for all sectors in Delaware County to come to us and collaborate with us in placing individuals and also to improve our employment rates and our retention rates. So as Jeff was saying, in terms of the impact, when we're at 50 people working roughly and you're at about a $1.5 million threshold of revenue based upon a $15 an hour, $30,000 a year salary on average of what we're seeing on income, Imagine at this rate, we're at 100 people by the end of the year or even 200 by next year working. So you're talking upwards by the end of next year, 2 million and 2 to 6 million in revenue of folks working and contributing back to the community. Uh, so we are, I, I believe in my opinion, um, in, in just thanking the council again for your support and just ex uh, explaining to the community that uh, uh, this program is just getting bigger and it's it's more successful than we predicted and we're very excited to see what the future holds um, with with what we're doing and some of the outreach that we're doing i've also already uh, worked with ivy tech and conducting what we call de-escalation and supervisor training so what we're doing is we're going out as a department and myself and i'm going out and we're educating the supervisors of all these plants these manufacturing companies and these employers with de-escalation training how to work with the justice involved uh, understanding the day in the life of a justice involved person. We're trying to reduce that stigma of, of an individual that's been convicted of a felony that may need a second chance. So we are improving the employment relationships between the justice involved and the community. So we are reaching those goals of reducing recidivism and, and social decay and economic decay in our community and filling those gaps and those labor shortages that we're seeing with, I mean, you see hiring signs everywhere and there's a lot of shortages. We have employers coming and going. We have a graduation set already. We have 14 that are going to be present for our first graduation ceremony at Ivy Tech at the Fisher Building on July 11th. Um, we're excited about that. Um, that'll be uh, 10 a.m. Fisher Building, Ivy Tech. We're gonna be inviting the judges. We'll be inviting the council members if you wish to go and, and uh, uh, give an applause to some of our graduates. Um, and we'll have some members of the press there. It'll be mostly just a celebration of the collaboration and our success. Um, and we are looking forward to the rest of the year of continuing to fine tune our programming to really um, look at what our obstacles are and overcoming those and planning for a, ro a more robust future for the program. And we are looking to make this more of a permanent fixture within the probation department. And the beauty of this is we haven't even started onboarding the clients that we expect to receive from City Court in our collaboration with the City of Muncie. So we are just working with the courts of Delaware County right now and not including City Court, which we're in talks with. When those doors open, there's a high volume of individuals that go through City Court. Uh, we are looking at uh, the expense. I mean, Emily's going to be overwhelmed, so we're going to have to get her some help. So she's doing a phenomenal job. Um, it's it's every day is, is kind of like organized chaos. Um, however, uh, I believe that we are meeting the goals that we that we put forth in our original uh, document. So we just want to thank you for your guys' support. Thank you for the update. Well, I. I appreciate what you guys have done. I know you've been the <coughs> driving factor behind you. It's all a big collaborative team effort, but I, I suspect this program will eventually be something that spreads beyond our borders and it'll be like a, um, uh, like a, yeah, a catalyst and a base program that others will follow. So, um, and you mentioned that. that the state has already shown interest. Loretta Rush, Chief Justice, has been monitoring this closely. We've already had outreach because I presented at the conference, Jeff, myself, Emily and a uh, couple of members from Ivy Tech presented at our state conference, the Judicial Services Conference. We presented what we're doing here. We already have outreach from Madison County, Vigo County, Marion County, Monroe County, wanting to come and, and shadow us to see what we're doing so they can try to implement it there locally with their Ivy Tech and in their probation departments. So this is a model that we're seeing with a 58% success rate, when you're seeing an average success rate of a ju criminal justice program being around 15 to 20%, yeah. and we're at 58. 
something's going right. And I have a feeling, especially with the, with the media attention, this may be something we see replicated uh, statewide, and if not nationally, um, it's just a program that has a lot of need, and I think it's everywhere you go in all walks of life. You guys should all be very proud of it. I want to add something. So when John started this program, I said, mark my words, the state will come in and duplicate this mm -hmm. because it's such a good program. And here we are six months later, they've already been to the state. I think John deserves a round of applause because this has been one check. Yes, and I will say also we have one other employee that's under Title 40 court with incentive funds, so we don't pay out of that out of County General that assists her with 40 clients. So it's not only just probation clients, but we also have people that are behind in child support that are in this program, but they also cross over in probation. So. Um, there's so many aspects to this program that we didn't think about until we started getting getting into it. And I am so proud of probation and John um, for this program that he himself, I know he doesn't like to take credit, but he himself um, created and got off the ground in a record amount of time. I just wanted to say yeah, that. Yeah. Thanks for that, Emily. Yeah. Uh, we're looking for more employers also. For, so those of you, you may know folks or for folks watching, we need more employers to, you know, reach out to the probation department, reach out to myself or Emily um, and figure out how they can, we can get folks funneled into them um, and kind of direct them their way because uh, we have a bit of a bottleneck there. I mean, in some ways you might be a victim of your own success, but we have folks in kind of this gray area waiting for employment. We need more employers. So that, that would be a request as well from from the council and from anybody else watching without, without naming names are there employers who are resistant to joining the program uh not so much resistant i think it's just everyone's so busy that when we you know they get their emails flooded with you know new programs all the time and they just may not really see so i think media attention will be important i think the more people that talk about it the more people that want to jump on board Okay. so to speak so the more we can get out there in the community the more um the more interest we can develop so we got we got to engage that curiosity of the community and we can take it from there so yeah and the biggest piece is for potential employees that go into these employers i mean we're we're helping to monitor these folks and encourage them and support them and you know kind of get on them when we need to and and you know make sure they get to work on time or they're 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 uh, following through so for for an employer it's really a benefit to them to have this additional entity kind of watching over their employees and kind of dealing with stuff when it comes up so that's a big that's a tremendous asset so so i would really again encourage employers to reach out to us to see if there might be a good uh, fit for them I don't know if this is something I'm just kind of throwing us off. You know, we grant tax abatements for things all the time. Is that something that could ever, um, for for our attorneys, that's something that could ever be considered for like a um, an employer to join a, a particular group like that as an incentive? Under the current statutory scheme, I'm not sure. That would be something we'd have to look into. I mean, generally speaking, those abatements are granted for the payment of property taxes for specific investments. Um, I'm not sure that the current statutory scheme, it, it, it's possible, I don't know. I can't give you a very good answer right now. There would have to be a framework put in place to look into to see if it would be something that could be done. I'm, I'm not sure at the moment. But the, the, the tax Expansion. abatement would be for the prospective employers that would be working with the program. and. It really just depends on what they're trying to do. I suppose if they were doing some sort of expansion, they were going to be purchasing equipment or something, and it was their intention to employ X number of individuals from the program, that would, the abatement wouldn't be directly related to the program, but it, the, the use of the program would certainly be a factor that the council could consider in granting the abatement itself. So in a roundabout way, possibly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Do we have any other elected officials of the department? We do. Well, <clears throat> um, Brad Polk, uh, County Treasurer. Um, I just want to take a moment today um, to remember Susie Dillon. 
who was a, the head cashier in my uh, in the treasurer's office for over 24 years. She passed away on June 6th and will be tremendously missed. Um, I would like to take a moment, if we could, and honor her today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We suffered quite a bit of loss this year already. The other elected officials, department heads. All right. Jeff. Yes. What? Jeff, could you give us an update on the? <laughs> made contracts or do you have an update you have an update how about that there is so close to getting by that jeff <laughs> uh, jeff stanley chief deputy sheriff's office after many many months of phone calls paperwork and uh, negotiations the contract has been signed and we'll go into effect july 1st yeah. we expect receiving inmates then after july 1st Congratulations yes. on the yeoman's effort. I thought you'd have been first in line to tell us that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great news. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Total Sheriff, thank you. <clears throat> All right. We'll move on then to public comment. I have two on the sign up sheet. So we'll start with Shirley. So if you want to try to keep it to three minutes, you're up. Good morning, Council, and everyone on the dais. I have to say, happy Pride, everyone. This is we're coming down to the end here this month. So, however you celebrate, if you do, happy Pride. Uh, this morning marks the third month in a row I've come before you regarding the inappropriate stunt of one of your own. In April, I called Ryan out for his mocking of coming out as a transgender lesbian woman of color. Anyone could see that he wasn't serious then, and he has since announced that he's given up that status after a couple of months of fight. In the weeks following him being called out by several local citizens, Ryan went on a nationwide media blitz talking with any right-wing podcaster or broadcaster who would listen to him and help further his woke joke. Some of us even found ourselves unwittingly so on Fox News, national television with Jesse Waters. I even saw myself on an Australian news broadcast, complete silence by the council. Last month at the May council meeting, I called out the council for inaction and silence. Two days after that meeting, Ryan, on his public Ryan Webb for County Council Facebook page, asked me inappropriate and extremely personal questions. Questions that were they asked at the workplace would likely have gotten him fired. For con context, I had responded to another citizen about an unrelated topic. Ryan responded me, to me with this, and I'm reading this into the record. Charlize, I am curious about something. You don't have to answer if the question is too personal. You speak a lot about how far you have come and all that you have gone through. I'm curious, have you had any of the traditional surgeries associated with trans people during their transition? Also, you say that you're still married to your wife of 20 plus years, even after living every day as a woman. What gender are you attracted to? And if it's still women, I'm curious if you and your wife still include intimacy as part of your marriage, since you now live as a woman. I can't think of anything more inappropriate than that. It's disgusting. And he does this because he doesn't think you're going to say anything. So he escalates it. He's empowered by your inaction. As a result of this, I have consulted with legal counsel. I'm working with Defer Varan, and also I've consulted with Delph McNally. And one more thing, President Piper, if I could ask 30 seconds. Sure. You, all of you counselors represent the whole 
county, right? All all citizens in the county. Can I get at least a nod of a head? Thank you. Okay. It's highly inappropriate that Mr. Webb would be sitting there with leftist tears facing me on his coffee cup. That's pan pandering to a certain part of your county and a shot at the others. So Bill, I'm, I'm, I'm Councillor Hughes, I'm sorry. I'm glad to hear there's a rules committee. I hope there's an ethics portion of it. And that ought to be included. Thank you. Thank you, Charlize. We're moving on. Uh, Rick Yenser, you're up next. Rick Yenser, newsman and author. Uh, wanted to talk a, uh, about a couple things about the rules today as what Charlie said. Uh, I think you need to take a look at the ethics around here. You don't seem to realize the damage you've done to this community over an issue of gender. But otherwise, again, the money. We're here to get our money. Uh, there's still a serious overdose and opioid crisis in this community. Uh, the state handed this county several million dollars to help with addiction and treatment services. I just found out that IU Health is going out of that business and bringing private contractors in to do that. And I think the government needs to do more to put the hands in some of the local groups where they are helping people, the hungry, the homeless, and the addicted. And beyond that, uh, the usual noise I hear from neighbors and others is that you need to do more with the roads. Roads and streets are terrible in Muncie and Delaware County. I don't know why a government had posted, I think, an $82 million cash balance on December 31st still doesn't have the way or the means to pave or fix more roads in this community. Because uh, as you well know, our taxes went up in May, and I'm sure they'll go up again given the November uh, billing uh, again. So we're not seeing too much service. But again, thanks for what you do. Thank you, Rick. Do we have anyone else? Yes, Chris. Thank you. I got here late, so I wasn't able to sign up. Um, Christopher Bilbury, um, I am glad to hear that you guys have talked about uh, House Bill 1167. Um, <clears throat> since I moved back to Delaware County in 2019, this is something that I have come to you guys uh, or your predecessors um, a couple times a year asking about. Uh, the budget meeting is, in my opinion, probably one of the most important meetings the the whole long process that you guys do um last year it was extremely uh disappointing to hear um commissioners um shannon henry and james king say that you know they're sick of transparency um that all the citizens do is piss and bitch and moan um they said that on the record. I, I mean, if they feel that way, if anybody feels that way with them, they can resign. You all can resign. Uh, you guys built that room and paid who knows how much money back there for that room back there. Uh, I have said to multiple people, uh, I don't know what it takes to run this back here. I've not looked at the equipment, but I, I am familiar with audio and video. I would be willing for free to train any one of you, anybody in the county. Uh, I don't know that this is something that you guys need to do taking uh, many um, budget. Uh, I don't know that this is something that you need to do to outside of the county. You guys could do this in house. You could train people who are already getting paid to be here to do this. It would not be hard for them to learn how to do this. I would be willing to do it for free. There are other people in the community, Roger Overby, and other folks that I know would be willing to uh, assist you guys with transparency. Uh, so I'm glad that you guys are moving that way. I hope next month is when there will actually be some discussion. I would like to ask you, at least if you're not going to do it, 
man and woman up, vote, uh, call motion, second the motion, and vote so we know where it falls. You guys have kicked, you guys meaning the council, it's not always you guys, it's just the council has kicked this can down the road too long. Uh, I don't, I don't want to go through this next budget meeting saying, well, we're going to do it in 2025. We need to do something this year. We need to do something next year. So please, please, please put transparency above anything else that is most important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the room? All right. So we'll move on to comments from the council. Uh, I did mention it and Ryan mentioned it too, that many of us, actually the entire council, which is the first time since I've been on the council, we all attended the uh, state called conference for Indiana County Councils Association it was down in Carmel this year. A uh, lot of great topics. We learned a lot about the legislative updates that impact property taxes and income taxes. We covered things on the opioid crisis. We covered uh, actually, there's a whole two parts about staying in your lane. So that's why when <laughs> I mentioned staying in your lane earlier, it's on the top of my brain um, and why it's important that the government has its checks and balances. Um, just a lot of really good content. And I'm, I'm very proud of this, this particular council for everyone attending and learning all of these, uh, all these updates because they, they do pertain to how they impact our budget and we're getting ready to go to budget session. Um, which reminds me that is coming up on Wednesday, September 6th. So mark your calendars. It'll be a full day of fun. Um, usually it's about a 13 hour day. I didn't include a time yet because we're waiting to get an actual updated schedule on how we're going to handle that. But it will start that Wednesday, September 6th and go the entire day. It's open to the public. Um, so if you want to come in and see it firsthand, you can do that too. If it's recorded, we'll have that option as well. Um, I also want to take this opportunity. We have to state this in a public setting that all of the members of the council now, I believe, uh, Rick's left, I believe all of us now have uh, submitted our 2023 conflict of interest forms with the clerk. So that's in the records. Um, I don't really personally have anything else on comments from the council. Dan? Ma'am, you're add to what you said about the, uh, the what we were just at the conference. We were just in that it's not just the county councils. We work with DGLF. Department of Government, Local Finance, and uh, anyway. SBA, State Board of Accounts, and who's, who's the third party? Anyway, several AI, yeah, yeah, but several entities came together to put that together to help educate us to make to that we can do it better at our jobs. I have something I'm going to add, please. Sure. So, <clears throat> sitting up here, you know, there were some similar comments said up here last month. I didn't say anything last month. You know, I, I let the citizens to have their say on what they want to talk about but this month i'm, I'm going to address this so the individual who, who just spoke up there um has spoke for a couple months now leaves out some key details that i think i'm going to uh, acknowledge first of all i want to make it absolutely clear i'm in a traditional conservative christian i don't buy in and support the, the left-wing ideology i don't buy into the pride i don't buy into the drag story hour i don't buy into the um, you know, drag queens for kids. I don't buy into all that. So if, if you're someone who supports that and you're coming onto my page looking for conflict, you're more than likely going to find it because I don't support it. I'm very vocal about it. I speak my piece on how I feel about uh, living in a traditional conservative community. Um, you're coming looking to get your feelings hurt. And if you stay long enough, you're going to get them hurt because I'm not going to sugarcoat what I say. You spoke about a couple comments that were made, but you totally left it out of context. You're coming onto my page looking for a conversation, asking your own inappropriate questions. And then when you get questions returned to you, uh, you throw your hands up and, and, and throw a tantrum about it. That's not the way it works. If you want to come and have a, a genuine conversation with me, we'll have a conversation. But don't start getting upset and making a big deal about it when you disagree with what I have to say in return. So I'm going to state that for the record for you and your attorneys and everybody else that you get involved. Second, after last month, um, there was an issue that had come up that uh, I was offended by as a, uh, as a council member and as a tax, taxpayer. Uh, everyone, as uh, Charlie's mentioned um, before, it is Pride Month. And um, I was offended and upset that our local Muncie Delaware County Visitors Bureau used taxpayer dollars to sponsor an event for drag queens 
where the proceeds of that event was going to an organization that supports uh, drag shows for children in front of children. I, as a taxpayer and as a county council member, don't agree with using taxpayer dollars for that purpose. I was upset about it. I emailed all my fellow, fellow council members, including every elected official, uh, to express my concerns about using taxpayer dollars to go to, to something that maybe 5% of the population um, uh, supports and pushes. That's my own opinion. I could be wrong on that number, but uh, we're a traditional conservative community. And I had a couple uh, state legislators reached out to me and, and they did a little bit of an investigation to it. I actually reached out to our, our council attorney to uh, see if we could um, put some restrictions in place because we allocate those funds for the Visitors Bureau. The innkeeper tax money, we we allocate that to the um, Visitors Bureau. And I wanted to put in some um, rules in place to say that no tax dollars will go towards any adult uh, convention, porn conventions, drag conventions, anything like that. Um, unfortunately, with the way that they're set up with how they do their budgeting, the only way that can be done is during the budget meetings. And it's a little tricky with them because last year they submitted a budget where instead of it being individual line items, uh, Jessica, you was here. I don't know if you remember. It was just like one big dollar amount where everything right. is all encompassing. So, there are five hundred one three C now. Yeah. So I don't really know how that how that works. Uh, but I will say that without giving up any names, you know, the state legislators that I spoke with said they plan on introducing a bill um, to make that a, a state law for uh, no innkeepers tax to be able to go to any um, adult uh, type of business going forward. Um, you know, support what you want to support in your private life, but it shouldn't be used taxpayer money to do things like that. So I'm not going to continue going on uh, each month. You're welcome to come up here every month, say whatever you got to say. You're a citizen and that's your that's your right to do so. Um, but you're not going to back me in the corner where I, I sit and cower because I'm worried about you coming up here and, and telling on me to, to the fellow council members. They all aware that I speak my mind. I'm very open about it. I'm very respectful about it, but I do have my position and I'm not going to um, silence on that position. And it may disagree with you and, and others and that's okay. All right. Thank you. Any other council members? Hearing none, our next meeting is Tuesday, July 25th at 9 a.m. Same place, same time. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Motion by Dan, second by Eugene. Roll call, please. That was Ryan. That was me. I seconded it. Oh. So you used to Eugene second it, Dan. Oh, that was you? I'm sorry. So yes, Dan and Ryan, my apologies. Ms. Plankin. Yes. Ms. Hughes. Yes. Ms. Kantz. Yes. Ms. Mokel. Yes. Ms. Webb. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Ms. Piper. Yes. All right, and that concludes our meeting. Thank you.